It's easy to look at stuff like this and say it's kind of like medicine. And so it would be kind of regulated like medicine, tracked and vetted by our government's health agency, like medicine is. But medicine goes through a very different process, a super lengthy process with tons of studies and clinical trials, paperwork. It takes years and years, and a lot of drugs aren't ever even approved. They fail this process and never make it onto the shelf. Well, there's something about that that I think you should know more about. The thing about the FDA is the FDA is, is not a full-time uh, a career job. It's a few years on the FDA, and then they're being courted by the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, and now let's take a look at the next part. FDA officials are supposed to be watchdogs over pharmaceutical companies. They're also constantly courted by pharmaceutical companies. You'll have a Merck going in and saying to somebody on the FDA, uh, I'll give you $600,000 if you'll come and work on our regulatory committee to go, to go into bat for us with the FDA. And they'll say, okay, well, I'll think about that. And then there'll be like a Pfizer will come in and say, well, we'll give you $800,000 a year to come in and work on our regulatory committee. And so um, it becomes like a bidding war like that. So the FDA knows that their next jumping off point to go from a lower paying government job to be a very lucrative farmer job on the inside, on the manufacturing side, um, they know that that's part of their career path. So that I'm sure weighs heavily into their decision-making process. And so I'm not saying that supplement uh, industry is not corrupt to a certain degree, but if you're implying that uh, the drug industry doesn't have a massive control over the FDA, uh, well, then you need to dig a little bit deeper into that topic. I mean, the rotation between people working for the FDA and the drug industry, and then back to the FDA and back to the industry, this is a, a well-known fact. And it's a well-known problem too, because certain drugs get pushed through without real good safety studies. And did you realize that 60% of medical reviewers that are in the approval process for these drugs who then leave the FDA go to not only work for the drug companies, but they consult the drug companies. Well, here's the problem with the FDA regulating supplements because of the ties to drug company, which is the direct competitors. You'd quickly see that a lot of uh, supplements will be off the market. I mean, even when I was in practice for 30 years, I don't remember a lot of people being harmed by supplements. Generally, Supplements are pretty safe. And supplements are in a whole different league than pharmaceutical drugs. And I'm gonna bring up one aspect of this that might not relate directly, but indirectly it does. It's called GROSS. And that uh, stands for generally recognized as safe. This also relates to a lot of the chemical companies that are allowed to do their own testing, okay, without the FDA and consider their ingredients safe. Companies are responsible for ensuring their products are safe and in fact can often put new dietary supplements on the market without even telling FDA. That is a big loophole right now with all sorts of new chemicals that are coming onto the market and putting into our food supply. There's no FDA approval process for that. And so the next time you hear something that is uh, gross, generally recognized as safe, realize that that is not through the FDA approval process. One of the supplements that gained popularity was called L-tryptophan. It was this health food supplement made of amino acids that claimed to help people sleep and lose weight. It sounded healthy enough until doctors found that people who took the stuff were developing blood and muscle disorders. So let's talk about this L-tryptophan because it's very, very interesting. Because in 1989, there was an incident where you had a dozen people die from apparently taking L-tryptophan. And just so you know what L-tryptophan is, it's an amino acid that can create some real interesting effects. Helping you sleep, it has an antidepressive factor, it helps to curb cravings because it's a precursor to serotonin. Now, I just wanna let you know, before this incident, 2% of every single household was taking L-tryptophan before this. So they did a big recall, okay? And the FDA banned the supplement. So to make a long story short, they eventually found out this problem was related to um, a batch of L-tryptophan that was contaminated through using a genetically uh, modified bacteria. So anyway, it got it contaminated, these batches got out, and it killed some people, which is terrible. And what you should know about this is about a year previous, Prozac was released in the market. 
it deals with this neurotransmitter called serotonin. And when this ban occurred, which was all over the news, several days later, there was a huge promotion for Prozac. And so they banned L-tryptophan for 16 years, which is roughly in the same period where the patents tend to run out on Prozac. But actually, I think the patents ran out in 2001, where they lost the monopoly over that uh, product. I think their stocks just plummeted by several billion dollars. But after that, uh, L-tryptophan was allowed to be used in the general market. And I don't even think a lot of people know the power of L-tryptophan. I mean, even if you think about this outbreak of E. coli from eating spinach, are they going to ban spinach for, you know, 16 years? Probably not, but they definitely banned L-tryptophan, a natural amino acid, for a very long time. This meta-analysis, which used 84 studies and put it all together to find conclusions, found that vitamins and supplements were generally, quote, associated with little or no benefit in preventing cancer, cardiovascular disease, and death had a little bit of a benefit on treating cancer if you already have it. They also found that people with a high risk of lung cancer had an, quote, increased risk of lung cancer and other harmful outcomes by taking one vitamin, beta carotene. Yes, there's several studies that show that uh, certain antioxidants, like beta carotene, for example, certain vitamins uh, increase the risk of cancer. But if you notice and you read the study, they always use synthetic isolated compounds. You see, in nature, you never ever see one antioxidant, okay? Antioxidants are about donating electrons to free radicals, right? So it then borrows an electron from another um, antioxidant, and so it all works out fine. Of course, when you test in a lab like beta carotene, that makes sense that it would actually worsen cancer. So what this basically is saying is that vitamins don't work for like the big things, preventing the killers like cancer and heart problems. And they maybe even hurt us in some cases, depending on the supplement. A lot of people don't even know what vitamins actually do in the body. Like there's this extra thing that we, we may need and we probably get from our diet, you know, so we don't have to worry about them. But if you look at your biochemistry, in order for uh, that to work, you have what's called cofactors, and that's the vitamins and minerals that allow these chemical reactions to go from one point to the next to create this biochemistry, and they're very, very essential. And there's new testing now, it's called metabolomics, that allows you to dig deep down and visualize what's happening with these biochemical pathways. One of the challenges in the field of supplements, okay, is that you have a lot of large companies that own the good majority of the supplement industry, which I believe has a huge interest in making big profits. So in other words, when you buy synthetic B1 versus natural B1, it's incredibly cheap. And then you hear these claims that, well, hey, there's no difference between synthetic and natural. They're both the same molecules. They work the same. Um, I don't think so. Two thirds of all vitamins sold come from raw materials from China. And those are purely synthetic, okay? Those are industrial made compounds, ascorbic acid, thiamine, all these vitamins, right? They're made in a lab. Now, even if it's on the label, it'll say made in USA, means put together. Where does the raw material come from? It comes from overseas in China. I personally sell supplements and I've been criticized by selling supplements. They say, Dr. Berg, you shouldn't be selling supplements because you're in the business. Well, my viewpoint is, would you rather have a drug company selling supplements, a large junk food company selling supplements, a marketer selling supplements when there's really no individual name behind the brand. I mean, check out these brands and who owns these brands. We have Nestle owning certain brands, Pfizer, Bayer, Clorox, Procter & Gamble, private equity firms, Another pharmaceutical company owns Nature Lab, global investment uh, firm, it's called uh, KKR. And then you have like Kirkland, which is owned by Costco. I mean, what's really bizarre is if you take the top selling vitamins, the multivitamins, uh, the first ingredient is calcium carbonate, the majority of that product. Calcium carbonate is limestone. You're dealing with like this rock and you're gonna put that as a supplement. From my viewpoint, it's not the best type of calcium you should put in a supplement. And so when you read this label and you see all these chemicals put in there and the synthetic vitamins, are they really focused on quality? 
or they focus on profits. I spend a tremendous amount of time sourcing the ingredients in my products and making sure it doesn't come from China. I investigate the soils that these certain products are grown on. In fact, this is one of the reasons I'm actually creating a, a very large greenhouse um, to grow some of my own ingredients. So I'm gonna create a lot of videos on it so you can see the soil. And I wish companies were more transparent about where their uh, ingredients come from. I mean, even like my product with vitamin C, to make sure that vitamin C was natural, it was a lot more expensive than the synthetics ascorbic acid, which by the way, 90% of all of the vitamin C in the market is synthetic ascorbic acid. It's made from cornstarch and sulfuric acid. It doesn't even come from any plants. Does our diet actually provide all the vitamins that we need? Some people will say, oh no, don't worry about vitamins. They're not really needed. Well, have you ever looked at the back of a label of a product and looked at some of the nutrients? It'll say it provides 2% of the RDAs for you know, vitamin A or vitamin B, etc. Did you realize that um, RDAs are really just average numbers to potentially prevent a deficiency in healthy people? And then you also have the dietary requirement intake. So if our food is grown on crappy soils or even hydroponically where they're just adding in 15 minerals, right? How can someone say that we have enough nutrients? And then you have the factor of genetics. We have genetics that sometimes can interfere with our ability to absorb a vitamin. And that's why when you test vitamin D, for example, they always test the inactive version in the blood and they might say, oh yeah, you're fine. But what about the conversion that has to happen through your, your kidney and the liver? Well, and what if you have a problem with the genes? What's the solution? You have to take more. I mean, when I was reading some of these tests with people, they have a problem with um, vitamin C, they have a problem with B12 and folate. The point is there's a lot of barriers for these nutrients to go in our bodies from absorption, from genetics, from the amount needed. Let's say someone has chronic inflammation, they have diabetes, or what if uh, they exercise a lot like I do, yet I was still deficient in vitamin C and glutathione. Why? Because I exercise a lot. And then when we get to other nutrients that are not necessarily vitamins, like the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, specifically DHA, which is an anti-inflammatory, if you're consuming all these seed oils, okay, that's gonna block your absorption of omega-3 fatty acids. And then we also have potassium, for example. The requirements for potassium are 4,700 milligrams. You'd have to consume a lot of certain things. A lot of people aren't aware that they need that much. And then let's just take folate. There's been studies showing that if you're deficient in folate, it can mimic the same damage to your DNA as radiation can cause to your DNA. Let's also look at um, the type of food someone eats. Let's say they eat a lot of grains. Well, guess what? Phytic acid blocks certain nutrients like zinc. And then let's say someone is a vegan and they're thinking that they're getting all their vitamin A because they're eating a lot of carrots, getting a lot of beta carotene. You have to realize beta carotene is a precursor. Uh, it's not the active form of vitamin A, which is like retinol, which is very high in egg yolks. You'd have to consume a tremendous amount of carrots. I think it was 45 pounds of carrots to get enough vitamin A for one day. And then you might be eating like walnuts to get your omega-3. Walnuts do have ALA, that's the precursor. It's not the active form. And that has to be converted into EPA and DHA. And you have to consume a lot of walnuts to have that happen. And so I'm not just picking on the, a vegan diet. I'm just saying that if you do a vegan diet, you have to make sure that you take certain supplements. And then you have fasting where you're not eating any food and then you're on one meal a day. Well, maybe you need to take certain supplements because you're not necessarily eating the quantities of food. Now your body will adapt and it'll be more efficient and your need for certain nutrients will not be as high. So number one, we do need nutrition. Number two, I don't think we're getting enough of the right nutrition. And number three, the supplements that are sold out there sometimes might not give you the right type of vitamins that you need because the source of them are synthetic but it's not just about vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, amino acids, fatty acids. You also have phytonutrients that I think in the future, we're gonna find out they create huge benefits for us. When a diabetic consumes more of these phytonutrients, they have less complications. 
But when I saw this video on vitamins, I wanted to correct a few things, add uh, a few things, because I am actually in this area. I know a lot about it. And yes, there is a lot of corruption going on. There's a lot of hidden sugars in these products. And I've done a video on that. Um, the hidden maltodextrin, you should check it out. I put it up right here.